Now, sometimes believers uh, want to study only exotic stuffs and prophecy and so forth. We do a lot of that. We do a lot of prophecy study. But you need to have this foundation renewed and remembered. Remember, the Word of God says we teach you or we bring you this to stir up your pure minds by remembrance. <clears throat> so even if you study the Bible for decades, you need to get the new application for today. When you study the Word, you get doctrine which never changes. It's the same as <clears throat> it's the same as when the uh, <clears throat> church was founded. Nothing's changed. It's been revealed in the Word of God, mostly in the epistles, beginning uh, in, in Romans especially. Acts is a, is a different kind of book. The actions of the church, the founding of the baby church. And then from there, you have the doctrinal foundation of Romans. And then the others are filled with doctrine as well, but they deal with certain problems and difficulties and administration and many other things. So uh, when I say this, I say that if you don't master the book of Romans, you're not going to be strong enough in life to withstand the storms that are coming your way till the Lord comes. It isn't a matter of if the storms are coming, it's a matter they are coming. It's just when. You either just got through a storm and you feel a little re relaxed and your faith is stronger in the Lord or you're in one and don't know if the tornado is going to take you away or not. You have to deepen your faith in the Lord or one's coming. That's the way my life has been, and I've been blessed not to have what I would think are too many serious storms that would uproot your whole life if the Lord didn't solve that. And remember, the Lord always goes through with you in the storm, or he delivers you from the storm, and he doesn't deliver you from the storm very much because that's teaching time. If you learn the lessons of the storms in the, that the Bible teaches us about, you will be a strong Christian. If you are, don't stand firm, you don't contend for the faith, you don't deepen your roots in grace and faith uh, toward others, and you don't build your testimony, which is a strengthening factor, then you're going to have a hard time. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about why you need to and try to get you to see why you need to attend. Now, I have taught this book before, years ago, and I teach from it from time to time. But here are the lessons right there. Those are outline lessons. How many of you believe you can endure to the end? Let me see your hand. <clears throat> How many of you are not sure? Okay. Well, uh, that's your decision. My, my particular command from the Lord and anointing is to teach the word. And, and if, if I could teach every Christian in the world, I would teach them the book of Romans. The book of John, if you're a newly saved person, is, a, is an awesome book to study because it tells you about God's love. But Romans is more the, uh, on the sovereignty and the power of God and what God does in our life and, and what we need to be aware of. A lot of us are fearful of the dark, and there's nothing in the dark. You know, we're sort of like the guy who got this idea that there was a monster under, underneath his bed and from time to time this monster might get him and he, he'd wake up to noises all night. He said, I got to have some help. So he had a friend that was a psychologist. He went to him and he said, uh, I got this problem. He said, what is it? He said, well, I, I, sometimes I think there is a monster under my bed and, and I just don't know what to do. I mean, I know it's kind of silly, but there could be a monster under my bed, you know, and I think like that. He said, well, you're going to have to come for some in-depth counseling. And my counseling is $75 a half an hour. You'll need to do that at first three days a week. And then later on, when you get better, we do it two days a week. He said, okay. Well, he didn't see him anymore for quite a while. He met him one day on the street again. He said, John, I thought we talked about this problem you had with the monster. He said, we did. He said, didn't we talk about how? He said, yeah, we did. He said, but you know, I, I couldn't handle that money. You know, $75 three times a week, that's a lot of money. That's $225 a week. He says, well, I know, but, but getting cured isn't cheap all the time. He says, well, that's not true. He said, I, I, I talked to my pastor about it. I didn't even want him to know, but I finally told him, and he cured me for nothing. 
Well, how did he do that? He said, told me to saw the legs off the bed. <laughs> and that solved the monster problem. So, the book of Romans will have, as we go through it, all, many of you have got a lot of questions that the book of Romans answers. The heathen, uh, the, the, the grace of God reaching the world, all those kind of things. It's all here. The Lord answers all these questions, and I want us to spend some profitable time together studying. St. Augustine was converted through reading Romans, because Romans takes everything and puts it in a dispensation of understanding. The Jews never could get, a lot of them never could get this idea that you don't have to do something to get saved. Then the Roman Catholic Church in 312 when Constantine decided he didn't want to fight the Christians anymore, but make Rome instead of a pagan nation, a, a papal nation, where the church would become a per, uh, the institution of authority, uh, then developed works as a way to go to heaven. That's where you get all these works that squeeze in these modern day denominations. You'll find some denominations that teach like Church of Christ and others, you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, that's not the truth. There are examples, there are scriptures, there are many things. Not the truth. There are some who say, well, and this is, this is called, uh, there are words for all this, but you don't need to know that so much as, as people teach the Lord's table is, is a necessity to being saved because you're taking of the literal body and blood of Christ. A lie. Heresy. The Bible says you can't partake of the literal body and blood of Christ, even in communion. It is a memorial. Now, memorial is not the event. It's a memorial of the event. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ is what communion is, just like baptism. It's, those are the two sacraments of the church. So when we look at that, these other things they've added on are man-made and appeal to people's pride. Well, I know I'm going to heaven because I haven't missed a mass in years. <laughs> That's what they say. Poor people, they need to be taught the Bible. Uh, there are others who say, well, you have to be baptized in our church by our pastor if you want to be saved. It's a lie. And the irony is, if you look at it, the only scripture they've got is Acts 2.38, and then Mark 16.15, the great command there, doesn't even apply to the church age. It's for the dispensation of the tribulation. Uh, how do we know that? Well, because it doesn't fit the description at all. But in Acts 2.38, the Bible says that you need to, what do you need to do, Acts 2.38? This is what Church of Christ is built on, one scripture. Then they try to find some others to prop it up. The reason they did that, the human founder of the Church of Christ got this idea. The Russellites, others. See, the, the uh, Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation came about because Martin Luther got his eyes opened as a monk in the Catholic Church and attached his 95 Thesis on the door at Wittenberg, denying these kind of things. And thus, that was the seeds of the Protestant, uh, you know, Reformation. Look at me. Bible believers are not part of the Protestant Reformation. Amen. Many of them are saved. Many of them are, uh, do believe the Bible. I'm not putting that down, but that's not how I got started. The church of Jesus Christ, if it wasn't in every generation, is not the church of Jesus Christ. It began as the infant church in the book of Acts. Every believer has been added to that church. And the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 has baptized us into the body of Christ. We didn't start with the Protestant Reformation. We are Bible believers. We are autonomous. Every generation of Bible believers 
will be guided by the Word of God and not by the Roman Church or the Episcopal Church or any church because that's filled with human error and as a result they're deteriorating. Now that's strong meat for strong Christians. If that offends you, you haven't studied enough. You haven't been informed enough. It's narrow, but Jesus said, straight is the gate, hard is the gate, and narrow is the way. If you believe the Bible, you believe the gospel, you're going to heaven Amen. by grace. It don't matter if you're saved in jail. It doesn't matter if you're saved in prison. It doesn't matter if you're saved on deathbed. It doesn't matter if you're saved in a nursing home and never see baptism. You're going to heaven. Amen. Now, Acts 2.38, what does that say? Let me help you because I know, I, I, just relax. I'll, we'll get through the book of Romans until the Lord comes. Don't worry about it. Come back next year and I might still be in it. I don't know. But it'll be, uh, it'll be something you need. Look at Acts 2.38. Here's the foundation of the Church of Christ. And also of some splinters of them people who call themselves Baptists, who really are, I don't think are. Then Peter said unto them, <clears throat> he's talking to all the people, the Jews mostly, the Jews mostly, hardly any Gentiles here, but there were some. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. There's your phrase. Now look at the word for. The word for in the Koine Greek is Epsilon Yoda Sigma. That's how you spell it. Epsilon Yoda Sigma, which you'd pronounce it ice. If you will look at any Greek dictionary or look at the study of the language, it can mean for, which means for it to happen. It can mean because of, which is his most prominent use. It can mean unto any one of the three, which will consider the context and the contradiction of other scriptures. Why would Paul say to the Ephesian Christians, for by grace are you saved through faith and never mention baptism in salvation? Why would other scriptures, and I can give you many scriptures, why is that true? Well, let me tell you why it's true. Do you go to jail in order to steal money or if you go to jail, is it because you stole some money? Do you know the answer to that? So, you see the answer here? It's because of. Because of. It never means in order to. All right, so let's look at it again. So read it the way it is written. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, because of the remission of sins. That's the Greek word. It can mean for or unto. Depends on the context. So how do we know what the context is? Well, if any scripture contradicts another scripture, something is wrong. Because there's no contradictions in the Word of God. There are many other reasons, and I'll teach on it sometime, but I'm just giving you the answer of why we have these Protestant, Protestant uh, reformations. Did good things come out of them? Yeah. But a lot of bad things came out too, along with the good things. Mostly good, some bad. The perseverance of the saints, which means that you can't persevere, but some of these taught the perseverance because of the 45 heresies promoted by all the popes from the time of 312 AD, and I have the dates on all of them, up until our present day. For instance, the, uh, uh, they, were, they were teaching and they did these things a lot for, for getting money, I mean money out of the people. Purgatory <clears throat> was invented by a pope in order to increase revenues. You know, well, we're not sure if he went to heaven or not. Well, you can't ever be sure you're going to heaven if you're a good Roman Catholic. You can't ever be sure. Because when you observe mass, you're getting your sins forgiven. What are you going to do between Monday and Sunday? If you die, you got a problem. 
see, grace is the perseverance. And we persevere at, we do not persevere at all. It is the Lord who perseveres in our salvation because the strength and power of sin can only be met by the blood of Christ. It has to be the atonement. It has to be forgiveness. It has to be justification. It has to be redemption. It has to be propitiation to cover our sins that we committed before we were saved, now being saved, and what we're going to do in the future until we die when we cannot commit any more sins. The time that you will quit sinning and I will stop sinning is when you can't sin. Did you know that? Now you are spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your body's going to sin, your mind's going to sin, and don't look at me like you're holier than me. If you are holier than me, uh, it's because you have been saved and I haven't. Don't you know the Bible says we are accepted in the beloved? Don't you know the Bible says we're holy? Don't you know that without holiness no man shall see the Lord? But that's talking about us. We are a spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. There's nothing holy about your body. Your, your body can act in the events of holiness and acts, but your body's not holy. <clears throat> you know how I know that? You're getting older. You're getting disease. And me too. We're getting older. We're not strong as we were. The body's going down. It's only a matter of time because it's not saved. If it were saved, it'd be perfect at about 33 years old all the time. How many of you have a good enough memory to remember back when you were 33 years old? I don't remember it. I just know I was strong and tough and could work 12 hours and looking for something else to do. I just knew that. But seriously, seriously, I want to tell you that if you don't get these matters settled in your heart, you're not going to have a lot of peace. You're going to be in turmoil all the time. Am I saved? Did I lose it? What did I do to lose it? What do I need to confess? I can't remember what I did, but I don't feel saved anymore. On and on you go. You, then your emotions come in and the demons push that. Then, you're, then the devil reminds you of what a sorry person you are. Then the devil says you're good for nothing. Then the devil says you're not worthy. Then the devil heaps it on and heaps it on till you woke out with your head hanging down. God hasn't done that to you. You've let the devil do it to you and you've done it to yourself. Don't be your own enemy. Why would you want to be your own enemy? My soul, there's enough people who are enemies against you already, isn't there? Haven't you accumulated a few? They'll take care of the enemy status. You Don't be an enemy to yourself, right? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The second commandment is what? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God expects you to love yourself because he loves you. Not proud, not pride, Humility, And the more humility you get and the more you say, Lord, I realize I'm nothing and Lord, I can do nothing without you, the closer you get to God and the more you rejoice because it's all on him. Amen. You know why I haven't been lost in 66 years? It's all on him. I, I had nothing to do with that. You think it, well, you're a pastor. You, no, 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 no. That's not true. There are pastors in churches right now who are going to hell. Do you know that? Amen. You know why? They're religious professionals. They're not saved. They're not called. How do I know that? Well, Barna just came out with a survey that said even 17% of all ministers admitted they didn't believe the Bible. They just had a job. Did you know that? 17% is about one out of five. I just heard today, Barna, who's the pollster, the, you know, the guy who's always studying churches and Christians, had a meeting with five uh, executives in major denominations. That would be Methodist, you know, I don't know, who, he didn't say Presbyterians, probably some day, whatever. And they said that giving to their churches is down 26%. That's a quarter. 26% is down and going down. They also said that the way they see it among all their churches, one out of five is going to never open again. They're done. 
20%. You see all that tying together? You see how that works? So, I just want you to know that Romans will clear up every doctrinal problem you've got and give you anchors to hold on to and power to hold on to because it all is of God. God, if you will allow God to mature you as a disciple of the Lord, you will find that he will give you greater peace when it's all on him. You'll have peace with God and you'll have the peace of God as you serve him in his will. He doesn't, he doesn't get upset when you fail. Now you get upset and other Christians get upset and people get upset. The Lord never gets upset. Do you know that? The Lord's never hunting you with a baseball bat and hoping he can find you when you come out of the dark room or whatever so he can beat you over the head. That's the devil's stuff. But that's what some of these churches tell you. Without us, and if you don't come every week and you don't take of this and you don't do this and you don't get baptized in our baptistry, none of that came from the Lord. None of it. We can trace it back when it started. You go back to when it started. You know, and, and you know, my faith goes back to when this book started. Amen. There have been Bible-believing people that didn't go into the Roman system of Constantine and all these popes. Always been there. Uh, they call themselves different names sometimes. Anabaptists. You know why they call them Anabaptists? Because the Bible believers would not accept the baptism of the Roman Catholic Church when a person wanted to join. They, made, they told him you have to confess Christ and you need to be baptized scripturally, not sprinkled. Sprinkling is not scriptural. The word baptizo is not even translated. It's a transliteration which means death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if you believe you were baptized by sprinkling, you need to be baptized to please the Lord. You don't, you don't need to be baptized to go to heaven, but you need to be baptized to please the Lord. Right after I was saved, I wanted to be baptized. I said, whatever the Lord's got for me, I want it. So whatever obedience I need to practice, I need to do it. So I'm telling you, if, you're not, if you haven't been baptized scripturally, you need to be baptized scripturally. God can approve you and bless you. He can't approve those things that are contrary to his word, even if you have good intentions. Well, I'm too old. No, you're not. We baptized 85-year-old, and you know when a person's 85, they're done. I'm within four years myself, a little less than four years. But seriously, we've baptized 85-year-old people because they came to that realization, hey, I, I want to please the Lord. I'm saved now and I want to be baptized. So we gently baptize them. We baptize, we baptize people in wheelchairs. Did you know that? We have men to take them down to the baptistry and baptize them. And the only people that trust the Lord once they know the truth that, that don't become baptized is because they're they're dying in the nursing home they can't get up they are in the hospital they can't get here they're in prison and been saved they've been so i'm trying to show you that romans will clear up all of that for you i don't speak with my confidence i'm speaking with the lord's con what the lord says the bible i don't have any authority I'm not, you don't come in here Sunday and I'm going to say, hear ye, hear the everyone stand, the trumpets are about to sound. I have a new declaration. I am Christ. I am the vicar. I am, I am the, 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 in play, instead of Christ, I'm here and I have a new commandment for you. If you don't do this, this, and this. You say, well, pastor, that'd be silly. I'd leave. What do you think the Pope does? What do you think the Cardinals do? Right? Come on, be real. Tell the truth, even if it hurts, tell it, right? Now, I love people that come here. I love people in the Catholic Church. I, I, I'm, many of them are going to heaven. Many of them are saved because of their ignorance. You, want, you know what I mean by that? They don't teach them any theology, so they're going to heaven because they're ignorant. They believe on Jesus. Wonderful. If they're messed up in other ways, it's not cardinal so they're going to heaven but many are not because they're trusting the church they're not you don't go to heaven if you trust the church it's not going to happen so here we have several things and i want to cover some of them tonight and tell you what you're going to get 
And the week you say, well, I've heard everything, you know, that's the week you will learn something you never knew before. That may be your week to help you be victorious over something you've been dealing with. It may be God's time to help you. That's why I want to teach Romans. Well, you know, I don't like that good as I do Revelation. I know because Revelation is tickling your fancy and giving you knowledge and it's good. It's wonderful and I've taught it over and over. But I'm telling you, it's not as great as Romans because Romans is where you're living right now, not what's going to happen in the future, though that is comforting and it's part of the Word of God and I'm glad to teach it, but you need Romans a lot more than you think you do, perhaps. Well, I, 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 I mean, I've studied Romans. Really? Really studied Romans? Can you tell me what the highlight and what's in every chapter? Have you memorized at least 50 verses from the book of Romans? Maybe you haven't studied Romans like you think you have. I know I have to challenge myself. Where, where am I in my studying? Do you think I know everything there is in the Bible? I do not. I mean, I know it by repetition and subject matter, but I don't know. The de wonderful thing about the scriptures are so great in, de and in depth that you can study the same chapter seven different times. You know, I, I can preach the same sermon seven times with the same text and come out with a different sermon. You know why? Because it's the living word of God. Amen. Don't put it down by saying, well, I know what's in there. I doubt it. I doubt it. I need it myself. I need this study. I need to be victorious in trusting God because trusting God's a hard thing to do. How many would say amen to that? Amen. You, you say, well, I trust God. Yeah, but you want to take it back all the time. You give it to God and you say, wait a minute, I think I can figure this out. Okay, let me, let me, let's take that back, Lord. I'll take care of it. Just give it to me. And then it gets tough and you don't know which way to go. Well, Lord, I have a prayer request today. <laughs> That's not trusting the Lord. That's playing volleyball. Okay, so Martin Luther launched the Reformation on Romans 1.17 because he saw the hypocrisy of what they were teaching, the popes and everybody else, where the Bible says the just shall live by faith, period. The just shall live by trust. The, the just shall live by God's hand. The just shall live by trusting God. And I assure you that the majority of Christians in America right now not all, but majority of Christians in America right now do not trust God to their potential. They could trust him. Do you say amen to that? Amen. How are you going to trust what you haven't studied? If God hadn't revealed things in his scripture to you, how are you going to trust it? You don't even know what it is. So I hope I've uh, presented this in such a way that you're excited about it like I am. Uh, and then even... Uh, John Wesley, who was an Armenian, good man, he and his brother, they loved the Lord, left a lot of good songs. Some of them are unscriptural, but they were good. <laughs> and I, I, I admire him, respect him. They led many to Christ. He was converted. He's the founder of Methodism. There's the first red flag. What's happening and showing up today is a departure from what John Wesley believed. All right? was converted while listening to someone read from Luther's commentary on Romans, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a tremendous man, indoctrinated as a monk, studied his theology as a Roman Catholic, and trusted Christ by grace through faith and went through a lot of, that brought on the Reformation and the torture of literally hundreds of thousands of people and their deaths. On one day, called Bloody Mary, 10,000 were, were killed. Protestants were hunted down as heretics. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Get smart. So here are the three things that you'll find in Romans in a broad scope. Number one, you will find uh, doctrinal truth. What is doctrinal truth? Doctrinal truth is set like gravity. Do you know how gravity works? By now, you know how gravity works, right? I opened the freezer the other day, and I like these uh, Jimmy Dean biscuits, but you have to keep them in the freezer. And I tear them apart so they're single, and I stack them in there wherever I can. 
and they've got a good egg and cheese. I don't like the cheese, I take that off. But anyway, you heat croissants, you can heat them up and it's a quick breakfast. I opened the refrigerator door and one hit me on the toe. Now, how can a biscuit hurt you? If it's frozen, it can hurt you. What does that mean? That means that gravity always works because it's held by the hand of God. Now, though we're speaking spiritual things, just as we see material things, if God's creation and God's rulership and everything runs by the word of his power, if that is true, and it is, you're not going to defy gravity, you're subject to it. Everything is controlled by God himself, past, present, and future. He does not control your will. He's left that out of his control, but he does control your providence. Now, what does that mean? That means that you sometime will make a bad decision, right? How many of you ever made a bad decision? The rest of your sleep are lying. I've made bad decisions, and man, do you have regrets. Do you want to go back and say, boy, I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have bought that. I mean, I should, that's a bad decision. See, God knows that's what you're going to do. He doesn't make you do it. He lays no compulsion on the will, but he has provided for it because God is omniscient. He knows the future. He knows where you're going to be. He knows what you're going to be doing because you decided to do it. You can't blame God for your sins, your mistakes, your bad decisions. Can't blame God. Because he doesn't make bad decisions. He's too wise to do that, so he isn't going to lead you to make a bad decision. If you made a bad decision, God will take care of that providence like he did Joseph for 13 years he said you meant it for evil but God meant it for good he knew what he was going to do in spite of what you did so you know what grace is in spite of what we do God gives us a good outcome if we are serving him in his will and providence or he gives us chastisement or he gives us a hard time to teach us to draw us see God is pursuing us all the time to draw, draw us to him. We make bad mistakes. You might wander out here a little while, but he's going to be around the corner someday, sometime soon, and he's going to teach you what you haven't learned yet. And man, is he effective as a teacher. Whoa. He's got methods you haven't heard of yet. He did a good number on David for a year. <laughs> and many others. Many others died tragically because God didn't save them from their bad decisions. The Lord may or he may not. He may ride with you in the storm, but here's the thing about grace, you need to write this down. I've told you this many times, I even preached on it. Grace will sustain you until God delivers you. God will sustain you until he delivers you. God will sustain you until he delivers you. Either by death or the coming of the Lord, whatever, until he delivers you, he's gonna sustain you. Just trust him. Now that's what Romans teaches. You see, the Christians at Romans were suffering. I don't mean they didn't have two TVs or a four-year-old car. I'm not talking about that kind of suffering that Christians think they're going through now. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about they were put in prison. I'm talking about the heads of families were sometimes beheaded. I'm talking about Rome was after them when this book was written. When the Holy Spirit wrote this book, Rome was after them to steal their property, to make them heretics, to make them because they were not worshiping the Roman emperor. They had another God who was Jesus. Then Constantine, who was of that sort, decided he would be more effective as running everything and taking over the church. So he decided they'd be a Christian nation. So what are we saying? Well, I'm telling you, it presents doctrinal truth which cannot be altered. Can't be changed. Can't be improved. Can't be weakened. Doctrines are things like justification. What is justification? Well, uh, 
Justification means, in simple terms, just as if I had not sinned. The Bible says we are in Christ, pure, holy, righteous, seated together in the heavenly places. Now, we don't look like that. We don't sound like that. Our bodies are still with us. Our will is still with us. Our mind is still with us. And, and our carnality and many days we are more carnal than we are spiritual, aren't we? Your carnality is against God. If you want to know what car carnality is, study 1 Corinthians 3. Carnality is for a believer, babies in Christ. Paul said, I can't give you anything but milk. You, you can't get strong enough to be a witness. You can't get strong enough to mount anything. You aren't helping the cause of Christ. You aren't helping with the gospel. You aren't helping the others and so forth because you're so dependent. You're like milk babies. Milk babies. And there are many Christians who stay milk babies. They're dependent on everybody else. Too afraid of what people are going to think. They don't take a stand like they should. Uh, they don't contribute. They don't help. They don't pray. They don't teach. They don't work. They are A-W-O-L, etc. That's what a carnal Christian is. Then there are worldly Christians who are, might not be, I mean, carnal Christians don't have to necessarily be worldly Christians, but there's some Christians who dabble in the world. They are serving God, but they're trying to serve God in the world too. And Jesus said, you can't do that. It's impossible. But you can't do that, Matthew 6. So justification means that because Christ died for me and you, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but also there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. In Romans 8, we'll get to that in a few months. Do you really believe that? Why do you feel condemned sometimes? That's the devil working on you. A lack of knowing who you are. A lack of knowing how much God has placed in your life. A lack of knowing how much God loves you. That's a lack of, of, of you don't understand how people love you and appreciate you. That's why you feel that way, condemned. Well, I used to, now I feel condemned. No, 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 no. God doesn't love you more because you are serving and God doesn't love you less because you're not serving. In fact, if you're not serving or reaching the potential of the talent that he's given you, he is going to deal with you about it, but it has nothing to do with his love. If he didn't love you, he'd let you go off the deep end. He'd let you hit a brick wall. You don't know how many times a week God's providence and the fact that you're justified and in Christ and that we're in Christ as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. How are you going to sin if you're in Christ? You see, 1 John unveils this thing that we should, you know, that we can't ever sin, but our bodies can and our minds, so I guess we're together. It's sort of like uh, a Roman torture where they would tie a dead man on the back of a person they were punishing and they had to drag that dead person around. You imagine how bad that can get? Well, we, that's what Paul said. He said, who should deliver me from the body of this death? I'm sick of this life. I'm sick of this, not of serving God. He wasn't weary in serving God. He was just weary. I mean, he, you know, at, in Romans 7, when we get there, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a picnic in Romans 7 and Romans 8. They are, they're one is under the law, the other one's under grace in exemplary fashion. Not literally, okay? Listen carefully. You can't change justification. Once you're justified is a legal and judicial act of God himself, and you cannot ever be unjustified any more than you can be unborn. Nicodemus said to Jesus, said, well, wait, wait a minute, how, how am I going to go back? And be a baby in my mother's womb and they'd be born. If, is that what you're talking about? Jesus said, no, you don't understand who you really are. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your body is your body and nothing's going to change about that. It's under curse. 
Think about that. You can't ever be unjustified. Well, I don't feel. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to really feel bad, turn on a hillbilly station and listen to how the guy lost his truck, lost his dog, his wife left him, and he lost his job. Now, if you want to get down, listen to that. I could write songs for those people with the stuff I had. They'd be hits. Because I'd tell them, you know, we need to write some songs about, I got my dog back, I got my truck back. But thankfully, I didn't get one woman back. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> Justification. You can't change. Now, look at the word sanctification. You know what that is? You have any idea what that word is? Sanctification is that God makes us holy, blesses us, anoints us, does all those things. That can't change either, but sanctification is like this. We are made holy by the blood of Christ. Our position is in the Lord, cannot change, justified, saved, redeemed, on our way to heaven, Names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's it. But as I preached, it was just last week, I preached 1 Thessalonians 1 where I gave you outlines and scriptures and a lot of things about Pilgrim's Progress. When we get saved, we start on this journey. And we should be progressively becoming more like Jesus, right? That's progressive sanctification. Then we have ultimate perfect sanctification when the Lord comes or when we die. Many of us are this close to perfection. Did you know I'm a lot closer to perfection than when I came here? Shirley and I came and started this church. Did you know that? 51 years ago? Almost 51 years ago? Did you know that I'm closer to perfection? Because I'm closer to the Lord's coming or either I'm closer to going. <laughs> and Mark, I'm going to be perfect, buddy. When you see me up in heaven, I won't have an imperfection. I won't say the wrong thing. I won't do the wrong thing. I don't have to be concerned about all the things I'm concerned about. I don't have to do that. Can you, can you imagine what it's like to be in such a sanctification process like Jesus that you don't sin, you don't say anything wrong, you don't do anything to hurt anybody, everyone loves everybody, Everyone follows everybody. Can you, can you imagine that? I can't. Because I've never been able to do it. I've been offending people my whole life. And I hope it was all for the Lord, but maybe, but I offend people that has nothing to do with the Lord. I have the gift. I have the gift of picking people upset. I have the gift. That was one of my gifts when I was born. I have the talent for it too. Sometimes my meanness comes out. I hope you're not around. I've tried never to let it come out, but it comes out. I told you, well, I have, I have not reached that perfect place by any means. So sanctification is First of all, our sanctification in the Lord being made holy. Like God made the temple, the things in the temple holy. And man couldn't touch them, even the ark, carrying the ark, unless they were designated. The ones that touched it one time to stabilize it died on the spot. God is holy. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Then we have adoption. Adoption uh, in the Roman times was much more powerful than it is right now because you, could, you, you couldn't change it. If you had a natural born child, you could disinherit them, but you couldn't do that if you adopted somebody. Did you know that? I asked my mother one time, was I adopted? She said, yes, but they brought you back. Uh, so I, I don't mean that kind of adoption. In the Roman government, you if, if, if you, if you were adopted, they could not change that in inheritance or any way. It was done forever. 
So the Bible talks about our adoption. We're adopted into the family of Christ and the family of God. You're all the children of God, Galatians 3.26, by faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.26. All right, so then there's judgment. Double jeopardy in English law was taken from the fact of the scriptures. If Christ died, it was judgment for sin. And if Christ died for me, and I was justified, I can never be charged with my, ju with my sin. Did you know that? That'd be double jeopardy. I can't pay for my sins anyway, but, if, but, but I, I can't be charged. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. You know who our advocate is? Jesus. Oh, I died for that. I already paid for that. It's not, no. You can't charge it to him. I, I did that. But our Father can correct us by chastisement in Hebrews 6. Don't you realize that? But that has nothing to do with judgment. So I can't be judged twice. And identification with Christ. The Bible says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've been made kings and priests unto God. In, in Revelation 2.5. Why is that important? Because every one of us are in Christ. We are called the bride of Christ in scriptural terms. We are in the family of God. We have a status of the church that nobody else has. The Jews don't have that. They are the chosen nation of God. We'll live on the earth, etc., etc. We don't have that, but every person born again into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit placed in the body of Christ, every one of us, every single one of us all over the world, all over the world are identified with Christ. Now, we should bring our bodies and our mind, our conversation, our thoughts, our actions, our deed to conformity in such a way that we're transformed, in such a way that people identify us as Christians. Now, you have to ask yourself, am I enough like Christ that people pick, you know, point me out? Well, you must be a Christian. What do you mean you don't take a little uh, Coke once in a while? You don't sniff a little powder? What do you mean you don't get drunk to where you don't even know where you are? What do you mean you don't gamble away your life saved? What do you mean you don't do What do you mean you don't do that? See, they should be arguing or talking about that to you all the time. You mean you go to church every Sunday? And Wednesday night? What are you, fanatics or something? Because where I go to church, we go at Christmas and Easter, we're called priesters. <laughs> we just go those two times. And get no more than they get, they might as well just do it two times. That wasn't nice. See how it happens? I'm spiritual, then I fall into carnality. Carrying a perfectly good conversation, then I say something of the flesh. Like I said, I'm close to perfection, but not there. I'm not going to ever get there. Shirley's never going to have a perfect husband. She hoped for that as a young girl. Wanted a perfect husband. Then she settled for Mr. Pretty Good. <laughs> okay, number two. What about dispensational truth? Do you know most of the heresies taught in denominational churches are, come from a lack of understanding the dispensations? Let me give you one example. I used to give this sometime when I was teaching, to, uh, and I teach the dispensations and I'll do that sometime if I live to be 90 I'll try to get it done I guess I don't know I'm just talking uh, look if you will in the gospel of Mark chapter 16 verse 15 and this is what the word of faith and Pentecostals teach without any proof at all Listen to this. Uh, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, 
Okay, well, we have that commandment in Matthew 28. We have it in Acts 1. So you can, you think, well, this is talking to the church, right? No. Can't be talking to the church unless it matches the scriptures of the church. Look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized. There we have it again, like Acts 2.38, except this time. By the way, both time it, in, the, in the early church, this was true, but... This is in the tribulation. You do have to be baptized as public identity in order to get to heaven as a tribulation believer, as a Jewish believer, as any kind of believer, but you're not in the church. In the Old Testament and the temple, when you went to the temple, you had to have a sacrifice. You had to have your tithes in hand of your crops that year or whatever business you were in. You had to also not only do the sacrifice, but you had to be sprinkled with water from the brazen altar. What does that mean? That was their form of believers, and they also had a tank, and those were distinguished. And when John the Baptist came baptizing, he said, repent. Be baptized every one of you and repent. He said, I'm carrying out what the temple said you have to do. You've got to come down here in this water, confess your faith in God, and I'm going to baptize you unto the remission of sins. That was the gospel of the kingdom, which will be preached again in the tribulation, not the gospel of grace or the church, although it's all grace. It's the gospel of the kingdom. See how people get upset and, dis and, and confused? The Jew is not the church. The church is not the Jew. The, give none offense neither to the Jew, nor to the church of God, nor to the Gentiles. Which means there's the world at large, Gentiles, that are not saved. There's the church where you're Jew or Gentile doesn't make any difference. There's no such thing as a Seventh-day Jew being a Christian that... If you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're in the church, this dispensation. You don't go back to the Old Testament for your doctrine. If you do, you're going to have to do certain things in order to go to heaven. In other words, you're always on probation in the Old Testament and in the tribulation. You're always on probation. You don't keep it up. That's maybe where the Catholic Church got you. You've got to come to Mass every week. That's where they got it. There's nothing like that in the salvation of grace and in the church. The dispensation of the church. We're the bride of Christ. We're not the nation of Israel. Now look at the next, look at the next part of that verse. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I agree that this is baptism essential to be saved, to be on probation, to eventually be saved, because they're not saved until they die. They have to be faithful to the end. They cannot receive the mark of the beast. They have to endure to the end. That's the tribulation. Believers in the gospel of the kingdom, Christ's kingdom, Christ the Savior, Christ the Messiah, not Christ the head of the church. How do I know that? Well, I can believe, I mean, I can read. These things shall follow them that believe. Okay, see if this happened to you. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new languages. That's an old English word, tongues, which means languages. It's an earthly language like you saw in Acts chapter 2 where they spoke in 17 different languages by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I see that, I'll believe somebody's got it. This gibberish, I don't believe it for two minutes. Because it's gibberish. I can do what they can do anytime I want to. It's not. It's not the miracle they're talking about here. How, why do we know? Well, the 144,000, 12,000 from the 12 tribes in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation can speak any language of any place they go or any broadcast or anything they do. And God says there's going to be multitudes who are going to be swept in the kingdom of God. And they'll be able to speak in languages. There won't be any language barrier. 
What do you think happened at the Tower of Babel? It was a language bearer. Before then, they all had the same language. God did not want everybody to have the same language. He gave different languages. And so to overcome that spiritually or, or I mean, miraculously, you're going to be able to speak in other languages. As if I could speak to a Chinese delegation. I've given that illustration. who came in here tonight and all of a sudden I could speak Chinese. They get to understand what I'm saying. That'd be it. That would be the gift of tongues. So it's been diluted and it's been perverted and it's been made something to try to get a lot of things going on. All right, look at the, look, but let's read the rest of it now. I hadn't seen anybody cast out any devils. I've, I've heard them go through the routine, but I ain't see that. <laughs> I've never seen that. They shall speak with, with new tongues and listen. They shall take up serpents. We're talking about the 10 deadliest snakes in the world that, that squeeze the life right out of you. You're dead in 40 seconds. We're not talking about little black snake mambos. We're talking about mamba snakes, uh, snakes. These mamba snakes get up on their tail and chase you. Cobras who strike you. Serpents, that's what they're talking about. A few of these guys, hillbillies up in the mountains tried this because it's the wrong dispensation and they had their funeral. The coffin was was prayed over and everything. No sign of life. You're dead from poison. You got struck by a snake. Okay, if you think you got it, grab it. I don't think I got it. <laughs> Guess not. And if they shall drink any deadly thing, why? Because the 144,000 are going to be hated so much by governments and the Antichrist and so forth, they're going to put poison in their water, poison in things they drink to kill them. How many poisons do you think there are that kill people? How many, how many do you believe there is? Different kinds. They have poisons that you can't even trace. But the 144,000 believe it can just drink a cup? No problem. You don't see anybody doing that today, do you? Have you ever seen anybody, preachers or whatever, drink poison? No. You know why? But they're preaching it, and then they don't do it. Did you ask yourself, is something wrong with this picture? Of course it is. It's not for this dispensation. You shall be witnesses, Acts 1.8. None of this is mentioned. He said to the disciples who was carrying forth the work of the church. In Matthew 28, take the gospel into all the world. Didn't include this. On and on it goes. Uh, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So there will be healing going on a lot. Now, is this the same as praying for the sick? No, we pray for the sick and God does the healing. But I'm talking about them healing. Peter could heal. He didn't, he didn't have to wait on God to do it. God was doing it through him. Peter raised one person from the dead. I mean, you know, on and on it goes. Somebody asked Benny Haney one time. Uh, had he ever raised anybody from the dead? He was claiming all this stuff, and it's just hot air. He's another one of those televangelist crooks. Uh, and he said, oh, yeah. I said, well, where was this? He said, well, we were way back in Africa. I guess that hides you pretty good. Well, did you take a video? No. Uh, you have any proof? No. Have any documentation? No. Because it didn't happen. Now, people have swooned, people have fainted, people have been unconscious, and they're brought back to life. But that was not what these people can do, these 144,000. They will recover. It isn't that they might. They shall recover. Some examples for you. Now, how are you going to, how are you going to, to integrate this in today in the church and not practice it? You say, well, I know somebody a snake bit and it didn't hurt them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get struck with a black mamba, you're going to see something else. I mean, there are some snakes that are not deadly. There are some snakes that you can overcome. They can snake bite kits and all this stuff. You know, I mean, that's true. But we're talking about serpents here. And in the Middle East and in many parts of the world, there, I saw a program the other night. I'm, I'm a little bit morbid because I like to watch these kind of things. The uh, snakes of Australia. Well, they got some beauties down there. If they strike you, you are done. 
They can't get you to any. There's no way to get you saved. Okay, so I didn't get to point three, did I? I ran out of time. I'm just trying to acquaint you with it. Now, I'm not going to go through heavily all of this. I'm going to go through it topically. I want you to read it. That's why I gave you these tonight. Uh, we will uh, look at this again next week and discuss some of it because we'll start then in chapter number one. And I'm not going to cover every verse, but I will cover every chapter and many verses in that chapter where doctrine is taught, where all these things, practical living, all these kind of things are happening.